Welcome to Inside the Firm, a podcast dedicated to small business owners and hosted by entrepreneurs, Alex Gore and Lance Psycho. Each week, they take you on their journey of how to start, run, and grow a business by bringing you inside their architecture and real estate development firm. Get a behind the scene tour of how these business leaders manage their clients and foster company culture while creating new and innovative projects. And now your host, Alex Gore and Lance Lance, welcome to Inside the Firm. Uh, I'm your host, Alex Gore. I'm glad you joined me every single week. Uh, Not even a co-host, just a uh, special a, guest. I don't know. A guest. A special guy. guest 150 times running. Exactly. Exactly. It's very nice of you to continue to be on the show. You're welcome for my <laughs> presence. <laughs> so, uh, no one is also cool besides you being on the show every time? You tell me. You Del, tell everybody. Dell's always having sales. That's a fact. But if you are a member like you are because you listen to Inside the Firm, you get an extra 5% off. They're already, from now until March 4th, there's exclusive offers of 40% off. Members save an extra 5% on top of that. You can take, it's like Lance, when you say, if you do one star, add four stars on top of it. If you're going to get 40% off, add that, 5%. Well, yeah, yeah. It's actually add five five stars on top of it. But if you're, if you're already going to Dell, Getting the discount, add 5% on top of that. And the only way you do that is dell.com forward slash inside the firm. That's how you do it. Dell.com forward slash inside the firm. Uh, there's a phone number and all this other nonsense. You're not going to do that. You order online. You're regular people. Dell.com forward slash inside the firm. Make it happen. We love our Dells. Uh, I was just talking to Alex before we started recording today. I asked him, how much do you love this battery power? And he's like, I just can't get enough of it. And I'm like, yeah, well you know, four or five hours. I mean, it's, it's incredible. Seriously. I don't have to, I don't have to worry about that anymore. I can just, if I want to work after, after work on the couch, it's having a glass of wine. I don't even have to get up. Yeah. Yep. Hmm. You don't have those kids climbing on your face. I don't have those tiny babies. They're, they're older. You got That's those nice. tiny babies. You got those tiny babies. Do you know what every, uh, professional in architecture dreads Al? The city. Ha! <laughs> Close, but no cigar. Very close, but no cigar. No, editing down a manufacturer Mac, manufacturer specification. Uh, let's say you're staring down, for instance, a 97-page specification and you only want one product and all of its attributes. Let me tell you, there's a better way. And it's not throwing out the entire specification into your project documents. It's ArcCat SpecWizard. SpecWizard is a patented, one-of-a-kind, automated spec writing tool that allows you to specify a product in minutes not ours. Just select the products and options you want to specify and generate a three-part CSI spec in your choice of formats. Best of all, it's free, F-R-E-E, and that requires no registration. I love that part about ArcCat. You can just go there, download stuff, make it happen. So go to ArcCat.com, that's A-R-C-A-T.com, and start building better content today. Hey, I know this is true for me. Is it true for you? There are websites that I find that I want their product or what they're doing or some sort of information. And if they ask me for my username or password to sign up, I'm out. Over I'm half out. of the time, I say no. I say even no. If I really I say it. I say no 75% of the time tops. I mean uh, plus. Yeah, because even if I like it, I know that I'm going to have to go back. I've already forgot my password. It's terrible. So, thank you Arcat. Yeah. Okay, I want to talk to you about two things. Of uh, course. Our second segment after what I'm about to talk about, we're going to talk about what we're doing to branch out more to construction and how we're doing that. Since development is just not that profitable. <laughs> <laughs> well, and what I'm getting at, there's lots of different ways to set up your business. And we've already talked about that. You could have uh, people in, in a firm. You could have remote em employees. Um, you could do construction. You could not do construction. And all of these are learning tools and lessons and, and, and uh, you know, great ways to think about to model yourself after or pivot from, right? But I think what I want to touch over is just an overview of no matter what you're doing, I think there's some core principles that you can do, right? And you yeah. could add or subtract from these, but these are the ones that I think are... No matter which way you're branching out. Which way you're branching yeah. out. If you at least think about these four things, I think it will set you up for success. 100%. Right? The first one is either to hire or to grow great people, right? And even if you hire a great person or are that great person, right? You still need to continually grow them. So what does that mean? That means training. That means building a community. That means talking, learning, putting yourself out there, gaining more responsibility, all that, right? So that's one. No matter which, no matter what kind of business you have, 
hire or grow your people. And, and, I, and, and, and how do you make sure you uh, give them the right feedback? You provide them a short feedback loop, right? Yep. So number two is shrink the feedback loop. And what that means is, again, whatever you're doing, it, you need to you need to shrink the feedback loop of th- that lessons from the real world, right? So whatever you're doing, whether it's a detail or out in construction, the more you just twill your thumbs, you could go on and on and on and on forever. So everything you do, what's that quicker feedback loop? Is it showing it to the boss? Is it showing whatever you're doing to someone else? Is it showing it to the client? Um, is it is it building something so that you know the ramifications of what, what you're doing? Is it communicating quicker with a client, right? Think about the feedback loop. Is it, hey, I don't know what to do in this situation. I don't know what that costs. Oh, I can pick up the phone and call my civil engineer immediately. There's a question about grading of driveways. Um, I just called our civil engineer. I, there's a question about pricing. I just called our favorite contractor, right? What's the quickest way to get the answers you need? Yep. Number three, hold a high standard, right? Whatever you do, hold a high standard, meaning produce great work. That's what that means. And then, that which leads into if you have a high standard, you're pursue, pursuing something of value enthusiastically, right? So the drawings or whatever you're doing isn't just for you, it has to be a value to the client. And I think that enthusiastically, even if it's a little bit of fake motivation, it leads into real motivation, not only for yourself, but there's mirror neurons your clients will be enthusiastic about it, right? It'll be a better relationship. You'll probably get more uh, referrals from it, right? So hire or grow great people, reduce it or shrink the feedback loop, hold a high standard, produce something of value enthusiastically. I love it. I wish you had a, uh, I wish there was a good acronym for that, but it's only H-S-H-P, HUSP. HUSP. (laughs) So just (laughs) HUSP your business and you'll be great. Yeah. Next thing is a F9, uh, F9 state of construction. And so what I like about that is that uh, the idea is, so what we're going to talk about is we are moving into Alex's on the cusp of, I think of landing his, you and your team's first house that you yes. guys will build. Yep. Right. Very exciting stuff. We just broke ground last weekend on it's we're calling it a barn dominium it's basically a barn on a 10 acre site with an attached um, apartment for the farm worker very excited about that and what we what the client requested what alex has been requesting what i've been requesting what i think whatever we've all wanted to do especially one of our big learning lessons from the development and, and taking that on as as builders in a in a regulated environment the tiny houses were unregulated right they were just anarchy builds is getting a schedule together and so I found this awesome piece of software, and then I've been working with, um, with the, the gentleman in our firm who is tag teaming this build with me. I'm the contractor, and he's the project manager. It's called Monday.com, and I, I encourage everybody to at least take a look at it. They, they are not a sponsor of this, this podcast, but what's awesome about it, and the biggest thing I was looking for is I wanted a, I wanted a way to be able to make a Gantt chart that was uh, visually editable. So we're architects. Builders are also very visual people. Um, engineers, are, we're all visual people, right? And so being able to manipulate, you know, from all the stages of the foundation, all the stages of the rough, all the stages of the rough outs, all of that, and then being able to have this one app where we can invite the subs to it, we can invite Alex and his team to it, we can even duplicate after we figure out how to link all the dates together. And that was our big breakthrough this week was I had Sam take a look at it and figure out how you can create, they're called dependencies in this app, which is cool. So basically if, if our, if it snows and which has been snowing every time we dig it snows here and we're delayed two days, he can adjust the very first date of that delay and it will cascade through the whole thing. And the other beautiful thing is you can, you can add your clients as they can just view your board. You can upload documents, so you can upload like letters from the structural engineer, just in case. Like, what if, what if, uh, what if the project manager just up quit or something, took another job? Mm-hmm. You can hand it off to another project manager. They would know where all the documents are. That they would know where they're in the sequence. They would. You can mark tasks as done in process. So far, so good. I, I'm very pleased with with taking this leap with it. Um, I, I just think it's going to help us be more more organized, and then it, everybody can see the reality of the situation. That's where the, we are. Yeah. yeah. 
Like if somebody doesn't show up, that's one thing I, you know, we can put a comment in there. In there, let's say the sub doesn't show up, and we go, "Yep, yeah, sub didn't show up today." Now look, look at that cascade of events, and you can track them. Yeah, and and because you can put a comment in there and track the comments, and then you could have a you could have a written record of. Do you do you guys see how many times people didn't show up? For who knows re- what reason? Yeah, maybe it was weather, maybe it was, it was whatever, or they're just they're just bad workers or something. Because I think that's like having the evidence of what could and couldn't go wrong um, is is critical for an architecture or construction project. But what do you think about doing anything for the architecture projects? I thought about that, but I thought there's it's too much of a like a I, triage. I thought about that too, um, and that's where we might go back to. I'm forgetting their name, Monograph. Yes. .io, yep. because they have that. The difference is setting up that sort of system to track something that's over a half million dollars of, do, you know, at a minimum and above makes sense. Where do you draw the line? Where does it, it's too much input for the reward? You know what I mean? Is it a $5,000 project? Is it a $10,000 project? Is it a $2,000 project? So maybe that's the discussion. So maybe after these bigger projects, we can we can scale it down, right? Mm-hmm. But I want to back up because if you would have talked to us two months ago and say, hey guys, where are you going next? What are you doing next? We probably would have said the trajectory that we know a lot of other developers have done. Oh, yeah. Which is we built a nineplex. Now we're going to build at least an 18plex at a minimum, right? We went from a tiny house to two, two tiny, tiny houses, houses to eightplex to now we do 16. And we kind of looked at some pieces of land and had our eye on a, on a couple. One right next door. It'd be like, it'd be insane to have an operation like what we are going to do yep. next door while our operation is right next door. Yep. And, and, and this is going in insane Lance's head and it's going in my head. And then like, then I was, I was thinking different and some developer friends were closing down some projects because they take too long. Construction costs creep too up and you can't, the and, and, and the market isn't going up. So the margin is shrinking. So Lance calls me, whatever day, a week and a half ago or something like that. He goes, yes. Do you remember the question, how you worded it? Not entirely. Do you? It was something like, Alex, what do you want to do next? Yeah, I think that's just what it was. It was pretty much the brass tax. Yeah, Yeah, what do you want to do next? And I go, um, or I go, I just think we should build single family houses. And you said, and I could be mixing this up a little bit. You go, that's exactly what I was thinking. I think Customs. maybe you said the first thing I said. Customs. Anyways, we are literally the same page as yes, we should just start building custom houses. So this strategy is different than before, meaning we're just taking good clients, seeing if they want to work with us and we want to work with them and building our architecture projects. It's totally different than the whole podcast, which was we're developing our own project and doing this. Um, so again, and it ties back before, we're still hiring great people. We still are keeping the feedback loop with this monday.com, you know, making it real, uh, holding a high standard and, you know, producing something great, but a different strategy. And I got a question for you uh, about that Monday because common sense is not common practice. Even with us who quote unquote smart guys, meaning like, oh, we probably should have had this for this project, right? Yeah. We it, Someone would said, yeah, common sense, you should have had it. But visually this when you talked about monday and this visual software and a lot of people are visuals even subs i wonder if it ever you know a sub ever comes and they're late and they show up and you have your computer or sam and you go hey remember when you didn't show up on friday we had to do this and then show them the cascade of events do you see what happens because you kind of say that or you just say you know you're late and and you just leave it and and they just compartmentalize it and then they just go but if you started showing people that, I wonder if they'd be like, oh, crap, you know, for this project, better not do that. I would hope so. I would hope so. I mean, something's got to give at some point. But yeah, that is a that is the pivot that we are making. And it just, if you don't, I, I think you got to be able to make pivots like that. Otherwise, if you try to keep, you can't put a square peg in a round hole. And I feel like we would just, that is exactly what would have happened if we would have tried to develop Go bigger. It. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it's the right way. I think it's I think scaling back and then us literally running the numbers and going, well, if that's our financial goal anyway, and we can make it by just getting basically basically four custom builds a year, 
Al yep. does too, and I do too, because ours is projected to be only six months long per this calendar we put up, which is awesome. Yeah. And if that's the case, then great. Then maybe we can start one summer, and then we finish out the year. And w- when we ran the numbers and the math of what we're what we were we're, we're going to charge uh, as a GC, and then plus the self performing stuff that we're going to do, at least in, with my build, we're going to do, um, because we're trying to ha- we're trying to get a construction staff up. It's the same thing as if we would have took this giant risk, but with no risk because we're building with somebody else's money. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So just another strategy and we'll, we'll let you know. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. <laughs> I think we'll you should you know. We'll be your guinea pigs. Yeah. So now we're architect as builder, which I like. We've developed. Like I can say we checked that off in life. I mean. And if we want to do it again, but the market, it's tough. It's tough. And we could go into this for a while. I don't know if we want to skip maybe some of the other things and go into this. Um, but uh, uh, it, it's literally, if you had to boil it down, what do you, it's like three factors, you know, the biggest factor is the risk in time. It takes a year to a year and a half to get things through minimum. development minimum for, yep. Minimum. So, and then a year to build. So you're two and a half years out. What's some, and, and these are medium sized projects, not, Hey, this is a high rise understand it's a high rise high rises are seven year projects that's what i've heard is that it takes about seven years yeah so um i don't know well so i think that's the biggest thing right how do you well the other thing i really like like in hindsight and i just thought about this is like we've always been volume based so this wouldn't this go with what our our idea was in the beginning is be volume based because we're doing four little projects that add up to the same if not more of a margin then okay let's let's build on this the, the, and then we realize if you're following your base, you make a template to execute quicker. Yeah. So, okay, we have the Monday template, but do we have a template? And I, I'm spitting off the top of my head where someone's a foreman every Monday. This is what I would like. Every Monday, every sub that's on the job meets at 8 a.m. And the foreman has a checklist. Yeah. What are you doing? What do you need? Who needs to go in front of you? Who's be, who are you handing off to? You know what I mean? Like, why don't we make a template like that? We should. And, and, and it's standard. An F9 project every Monday, every sub is meeting here. You know, it's different than an architecture template, but it's a how we execute template. Yep. Okay. I like that. Yep. I like it too. Yeah. So that's where we're at. Um, switching, switching up things. I want to... Alex and I, did you listen to this episode? I listened to the whole thing. I did. So uh, our good friend Enoch Sears, he uh, messaged me the other day, a couple weeks ago actually, so this is an older episode of his, but it's recent, um, and his are all timeless in my opinion. Mm-hmm. It's episode uh, 313 of his podcast, The Business of Architecture, and he messaged me and said, I would love it. This this episode reminded me of a lot of you you and Alex, and I was actually, I'm actually really flattered because now that I listen to it, like I don't know if we're wildly successful, because uh, <laughs> I, think, like I think we're so sex, successful, we, we have grown a firm. We're now up to 10 people technically, mm-hmm. including the construction staff um, in 10 years. So I think that's, I think that's good. Ah, look at that. But these guys are insanely impressive. So episode 313, it's called Growing a Wildly Successful Architecture Practice with Nunzio uh, and Mark DeSantes. And it's a father-son combo. Yep. I thought to myself, that sounds difficult. They work through it just because like... I work okay with my dad and just okay on this last time because right. like I was a little bit, uh, I was just, I needed, we both needed a bailout and we were just like, however you can help us, you know, bowing down to, to dads and, and they would just bail us out. But in a, but in a different scenario where I think you're partnering with somebody, I don't know, that, that seems difficult, but, the, but they waited through it. And there's a few takeaways from that episode that I wanted to ask you about that I really liked Al. And one of them was putting Young people out front. Yes. I loved that part. I love that part because we preach that and, and practice it of we will allow our staff to bite off as, chew as much as they want to bite off, right? Take take as much of that rope as they want to within reason. I, I think that's where, but making sure that you have the feedback loop because when they, as they're taking stuff, if they're taking rope out, giving them the feedback as they take it out so that they don't literally hang themselves in yeah. a project. Right. And then setting them up for success by training, um, and showing them, you know, how we did it so that they can be confident when they're selling. Um, and w- it, it's funny. I feel like a lot of people are maybe nervous about that, but if you think about when you were in that position, like mm-hmm. we were the younger, we were younger than them probably. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So I like that. The other thing that was great was the dad. Man, could that guy sell. The way I love the way he talked. Exactly. So I almost want to listen to it again just mm-hmm. to just to get the flow and where he's coming from. Um, he could sell. One of the reasons why I think he could sell is another point is that he he said they will visit they when they go to do a new hotel. What they'll do is they'll go to a city like New York and they will visit like thirty of them. You remember this part? And yep, they will I become. Do. And so he, he's like, visit your typologies as many as you can before you start the project. So you be, like, basically become a scholar. Yeah. Like you know the hottest trends, what did work, what didn't work, what you could apply to your project. Just so you have this, you have literally like thirty balls in your head that you're juggling all at one time, and then you can pick from them. Yep. As you as you work on your project. Yeah. What do you think about for the summer? Getting getting a limo for a summer party. I know. I thought about. I thought about. We should just. We should. It. We should truly be like a building tour day. But 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 go to the open houses of the neighborhoods. Yes. And stuff like that. Yeah. Exactly. That's what it should be for our project. For us, because we do a lot of residential. Yeah. Is it? It should be. We should go to the parade of homes, open houses type of stuff. Yep. If we ever got super rich and 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 fun, know what I'd want to do? What? Fly to. Um, San Diego, I'm making up a place, right? Do that on, on like a Friday and then, you know, like have fun Friday night and then Saturday time it for like one of those mud runs, like one of those like fun events and then come back. That's kind of crazy, but that, I, yeah, he, I, he, I was into this, I don't know, popping ribs out because he's M- MMA. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Pop, I, that did happen. Um, one thing I like about how he sold too, like he brought his typology down to experiments experience and emotion yeah which it's very true because they design resorts and then he also sold on oh, especially the experience i mean seriously like think about it that's the point of a, that's the point of a, res- a resort is yep. the experience yep but then he tacked onto that the exper- experience that he had and how it can help them too in construction design saving costs so it's like somehow he nailed the greatest concerns of that typology and was able to sum it up back to them. So if somehow we could nail the greatest concerns of whatever our typology is and say it back Just to them house. more eloquently than they can even express, that's where the aha goes. I'm obviously going with this yeah. person. And what it, what, it, what, it, what it comes down to is to back up, I, I, my phone didn't show this. Enoch put this at the beginning of his episode. He says, if you're listening to this and you've taken my dream practice accelerator course, the idea is is that these guys are living their dream practice. This is all they yes. want to do, and they're extremely picky about who they take on. And they went in two years to to to, to say why they are wildly successful. Two people to twenty. Yeah. It took us ten years to get from two people to ten. Yeah. Well, the, yes, and that's very impressive. The dad is probably like fifty years old, so he, you know, like starting this, it'd be like us starting a new thing in ten years, fifteen years from now. So it's not starting from like age 23 literally yeah (laughs) but but still um that i don't mean to take away at all because i am very impressed with that episode the only thing i was disappointed with i was hoping that they would peel back how they how they how they act like step by step how they managed to go from two to 20 people in the logistics and he probably don't have time to get into it so he gave it like a hot he all he basically said is we had to work very hard and there's no such thing as 40 hour week there's also no such thing as an 80 hour week we just had to work really hard. Yeah. So whatever that, you know, take that for what it's worth. They had to work really hard yep. to manage that and find the right people and build the right team. So it was a cohesive and that they built into this. They b- bought into the, the idea that they're trying to do. Uh, my favorite part, though, by far, was that um, he said, we strive. He's like, one of the things I um, pride myself on is that I'm being extraordinarily honest. And I was like, yes. Yes, you have to be. You have to be with clients. It just gets you in so much trouble when you just you just uh, sugarcoat things mm-hmm. because you can tell it's a hot point for them or something they're, you know, or they they're scared of like, well, if we have to do that, then I have to, you know, I'm gonna have to put in a new bathroom for this little project that I don't have a budget for. Yes. Imagine you going through the motion with them and telling them and saying, well, maybe the city won't catch it or whatever. And then they spend tens of thousands of dollars on you and then their project ends up dying because they literally, there's two big things that they, they thought they were going to be able to do that they can't, that they, or that they wouldn't have to do, but they have to do. 
that that was critical. And then the piggyback onto that is that uh, architecture is hard. The building process is hard. We're all going to make mistakes, but your key is you need to be the problem solver when, when the problem comes up. You need to be that reassurance to the client. You need to be an extension of their advisors, right? Like you are a paid advisor to them. And if, if they don't recognize you as that, I think it's going to be a problem. Yep. Yep. Um, so go listen to that episode. It's on business of architecture. It's not that far down. You'll find it easily. It's how to uh, growing a wildly successful firm. Um, and with that, we'll pitch it over to another wildly successful firm, uh, Nick from Dig Architecture. Hello, best friends. I hope you all had a great week this week. A reading. The traditional image of the radical architect is the angry young man rebelling against the establishment. The avant garde is defined by what it is against rather than what it is for. This leads to an Oedipal succession of contradictions where each generation says the opposite of the previous. And if your agenda is depending on being the opposite of someone else's, you are simply a follower in reverse. Rather than being radical by saying forget the context, the establishment, the neighbors, the budget, or gravity, we want to try to turn pleasing into a radical agenda. Besides the obvious societal virtues, these principles have had a significant side effect on the realm of architecture. A gray goo of sameness accounting for the vast majority of the urban tissue where most attempts to stick out have been beaten down into the same non-offensive generic box. And all libido invested into polishing and perfecting the ever finer details. The sum of all the little concerns seems to have blocked the view of the big picture. What if trying to make everyone happy did not have to lead to compromise or the lowest common denominator? It could be a way to find the ever elusive somersault that twists and turns in order to fulfill every desire and avoid stepping on anyone's toes. Rather than revolution, we are interested in evolution. Yes is more, Bjarke Ingels. Lance, I didn't forget you last week. Happy birthday, my friend. Toodles! Aw, thanks, Nick. Um, I like that. I've never heard that uh, following in reverse. Doing the opposite of somebody else is following in reverse. That is a good that way of putting it. Really hit. It. Yeah, that was that was fantastic. Yep. Because I am a contrarian. Ooh. If you haven't noticed. Yep. Uh, and so is Al to an extent. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I like. And then the idea of that you you know like a revolution. See, the thing about revolutions is, is that revolutions are dirty, they're bloody, they're disruptive, but evolutions, they're, it's more natural, um, it seems like it's more peaceful, right? Yep. And I think it's more admirable. Yep. So that's what we're doing, even though we are, even though we are, uh, how about this? We are not following the lead of everybody else and going bigger and better again, right? Yeah. Instead, we are... We we are rethinking. We are rethinking it. What was born out of the development was a construction company, a construction arm. Yep. And that's how we are evolving. Mm-hmm. So take so, that for what it's worth. So let's uh, transition to our next segment, which is Fugly Fridays. Yeah. Welcome to Fugly Friday. Is it Friday? Is it Friday Fugly? It's Friday Fugly? Fugly Friday. It's Fugly Friday. 
to reiterate, this is uh, we are just uh, several of our staff members are in this wonderful group. Today is uh, Mark Pedler. He's he's going to talk to us about um, some some things that they came across in uh, the Fugly Group, which is basically a group of NIMBYs and people from the outside the in- construction industry that love to critique the construction industry. So what do we got today, Mark? All right. Uh, I'll start off by saying this is an article from the Denver Post. Uh, it was February 10th, 2020 by Aldo Savaldi. And here's the main takeaway. Where are the millennials, the largest generation right now, 83 million strong, going to settle down? Some data from City Lab says millennials want to live in the urban core. Uh, the perks include density, proximity to work, walkability, restaurant stores, cultural and environmental scene. And millennials are delaying marriage and having kids in part because of the Great Recession and heavier debt loads. Chapman University says actually for every one millennial that settles in an older urban area, another four are moving into the suburbs where houses are more affordable. Wow, four to one. Yeah. So this is probably my favorite part. Millennials want the best of both worlds, more affordable and spacious housing and better school districts that are found in the suburbs, but the walkability and bustle of the older neighborhoods the Urban Land Institute and PwC released emerging trends in real estate 2020 and coined the term hipsterbia. <laughs> I immediately want to take 100 to 200 acres and design a hipsterbia. I feel like How we could do a better be? neighborhood than, than any of these developers. Like, I already like my neighborhood. Our firm is millennial. I know. I'm a you, you guys have been to my house, right? Remember, I'm like, oh, there's a school right there, and I can walk to Safeway and all that. And I'm like an older millennial, so like I barely count, right? But the cool things that we could do with like knowing that concept and and literally saying that would be awesome. Hipsterbia, Colorado. Yeah. So this, so what you just read is basically like the synopsis of the article. Yeah, that's my synopsis. Okay, and then you posted it. And how? What's how? How are the reactions from all the NIMBYs then with this with this data from? white papers that is the truth uh i mean most of it's pretty reasonable wow are we shocked that millennials will eventually follow the same patterns that everyone ever yeah. has before them um some of them are pissed off about sprawl and reliance what, on the automobile what's crazy too is that i think a lot of people love the neighborhoods right outside of downtown that are beautiful that are quaint that have great trees mm-hmm. i bet you a hundred years ago the people that were in the original downtowns were like, oh, you live down on Kim Bark Street, two streets away in your old little house that has no trees. You're not going to be right over the bar, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, let's see how many it had. This one had 118 comments on it. Wow. And yeah, I guess a lot of, some people say they're opting for the suburbs for different reasons. Um, I don't know. Everyone just wants to fight whether it's better to be living in the suburbs for less money or paying more money to not have to drive and save the environment. True. Yeah. I want to will this. I want to get with our civils and start pitching developers and say, we want to design hipsterbia. What do you think, Mark? I'm in. I think it'd be awesome. Yeah. So then the last thing I would say to wrap up this little segment today is that uh, if the suburbs are exactly what, every, what Alex just described. So, like, when we were in college, one of the epiphanies we had was our professors kind of basically told us, like, guys, the suburbs that we live in now that you guys love, well, they're not even suburbs. The the What was the suburb once in the edge of the city is now has the big trees. They're the big, beautiful trees that everybody wants. All the houses look different. That's because, like they've went through one life cycle already and they've people have redone their facades right and re- remodeled their stuff so they all they all get character at the end of the day and the idea with this with um, cookie cutter housing is that it it's affordable right so you got to you got to plant your seeds somewhere the thing i would encourage everybody to think about and if they aren't already doing it is is especially because it's so hard to develop now is that if you can convince your city and form a yimby group a yes in my backyard group Go go listen to Scott uh, Byers' uh, podcast episode, the the Market Urbanism Report. He's he's doing great work. Is that you know uh, doing stuff like Minneapolis is doing, which sounds crazy, but it it makes sense to me. Is like you abolish single family zoning, so there's no more single family zoning. So like on a single family house or lot that's maybe it's an older one like an acre. All of a sudden, could you put up a fourplex? Could you start densifying that that city? The only way we're ever going to get out of this. Na- the house, present housing crisis is if we start building more. So it's got to, it's got to happen. Right. What do we got next? Area Jeopardy. We do. Here we go.
According to the IECC, what climate zone in Longmont are we in? A, four. B, three. C, six. D, five. So what climate zone in Longmont are we in? A, four. B, three. C, six. D, five. Hold them up. D, D, B, D, D. D is correct. D is correct. Now you know. (laughs) Climate zone five. Okay. Question number two. According to 2015 IRC, what level of weathering probability for concrete are we in in Colorado? Okay. You probably didn't even know this existed. A, negligible. B, moderate. C, severe. Concrete probability of weathering. A, negligible, B, moderate, C, severe. Do-do-do, B, C, B, A, C, C. The answer is C, severe. <laughs> For real? Oh, so one of our guys, you probably can't hear because he doesn't have the mic, but he was going over it today. I didn't even know that existed. Severe? So, no, that there was a, this map existed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, number three. When installing a new cistern underground, what is the minimum distance required between it and a leach field? A, 25 feet. B, 50 feet. C, 75 feet. D, 100 feet. Sam's giggling. <laughs> is, Everybody know? Everybody good? Okay. Is this collusion? A little bit. Uh, C, uh, so C, B. What do you got? C. C. Oh, oh, Sam's got D, uh, C, and B. The correct answer is uh, D, because Sam and I uh, are going through that right now with the new well we're digging. I feel he only gets a half point. That's clear collusion. Half point on that one. Uh, Independent ruling. Now, this is that was just for Colorado, because we are digging a new well for the new construction project that we're working on. Okay, but there's a follow-up question. Number four, when installing a new cistern underground... What is the minimum distance required between it and a septic tank? A, 25 feet. B, 50 feet. C, 75 feet. D, 100 feet. Sam is not smiling this time. (laughs) Good. Because this one was a little bit hidden. This will be a full point if he gets it. Uh, Yeah, go ahead, Al. B, A, C, B, B. Correct answer is B. There we go. 50 feet. I feel like at least one person has three correct answers. Two. Two and a half. We have our winner. All right, Jason. no tiebreaker. Um, is that it? That's all we got. What do we got? Uh, if you word, enjoy word. the podcast, you're gonna enjoy Revit Rocket Ship because you're gonna learn Revit like you're on a rocket ship. It's gonna be that exciting. If not, you can get your money back guaranteed. But if you learn something, you probably shouldn't ask for your money back. But if you hated it, we'll give it back to you. So that's all I got. If you haven't left us a uh, five star review and you're thinking about leaving us a two star review, just throw five stars right on top of that. Go to your iTunes app, scroll up, leave us a five star review. Send uh, Alex at AKG a screen cap of the five star review and you will get a free PDF copy of the book. Steal your partner's phone. Do the same thing. There you go. Talk to you next week.